Well, happy Wednesday. Now, I'm going to read from a book which I'm going to show you momentarily, but you know, one good thing leads to another. I want to tell you a story. I did mention it in a previous edition, but uh, Cinda and I did a play, Dear Elizabeth, probably two years ago, and I want to show you how nothing is wasted and threads go backwards and, and forwards. Uh, I have long been a customer of story and song, and I saw a book. It, it's about uh, the play itself is about uh, Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Bishop. Well, a recently published book I ordered here, Robert Lowell, and it is Setting the River on Fire, a study of genius, mania, and character by K. Redfield Jameson. Really extraordinary psychological uh, biography. Well, guess what? I played the role of Robert Lowell, so I read this. But then I found this. Love Unknown, The Life and Worlds of Elizabeth Bishop by Thomas uh, Trevisano. I just happened to be paying for something at the front desk and I saw this out of the corner of my eye and of course reached out and grabbed it. But the very first book that I got at Story and Song was when I knew we were going to do the play. The play was based on letters that Robert Lowell and uh, Elizabeth Bishop sent to one another. This is fabulous. Words in air. And this is literally uh, a compilation of all these letters. And can we discuss thick? They really talk to one another quite a bit. It really is quite wonderful. Um, and Thomas uh, Trevisano uh, is, was one of the editors of this. Now, all of this is the preamble of books I got at Story and Song leading to today's poetry section. Poems of the Sea, and it is part of that Everyman's uh, Library, really quite, uh, quite fabulous. And it's uh, selected and edited by J.D. McClatchy. Now, with this long preamble, it's all because I'm going to indulge myself today. I want to read a poem by none other than Robert Lowell. Uh, and I'm going to start with this, and I will forewarn you, it's a long poem, but I think a magical journey. The Quaker Graveyard in Nantucket, for Warren Winslow, dead at sea. Let man have dominion over the fishes of the sea, and the fowls of the air, and the beasts of the whole earth and every creeping creature that moveth upon the earth. One, a brackish reach of shoal off Madiket. The sea was still breaking violently, and night had steamed into our North Atlantic fleet when the drowned sailor clutched the drag net. Light flashed from his matted head and marble feet. He grappled at the net with the coiled hurdling muscles of his thighs. The corpse was bloodless, a botch of reds and whites. Its open, staring eyes were lusterless, dead lights. Or cabin windows on a stranded hulk heavy with sand. We wait the body, close its eyes, and heave it seaward whence it came, where the heel-headed dogfish barks its nose on Ahab's void and forehead, and the name is blocked in yellow chalk. Sailors, who pitch this 
portent at the sea, where dreadnoughts shall confess its hell-bent deity. When you are powerless to sandbag this Atlantic bulwark faced by the earth shaker, green, unwearied, chased in his steel scales, ask for no Orphean flute to pluck life back. The guns of the steel fleet recoil and then repeat the horse salute. Whenever winds are moving and their breath heaves at the roped-in bulwarks of this pier, the terns and seagulls tremble at your death in these home waters. Sailor, can you hear the Pequod sea wings beating landward, fall headlong and break on our Atlantic wall off Sconset? Where the yawning S boats splash the bell buoy with ballooning spinnakers as the entangled screeching main sheet clears the blocks of Madakin, where the lubbers lash the heavy surf and throw their long lead squids for bluefish. Seagulls blink their heavy lids seaward. The wind's wings beat upon the stones, cousin, and scream for you, and the claws rush at the sea's throat and wring it in the slush of this old Quaker graveyard where the bones cry out in the long night for the hurt beast bobbing by Ahab's whale boats in the east. All you recovered from Poseidon died with you, my cousin, and the harrowed brine is fruitless on the blue beard of the god, stretching beyond us to the castles in Spain, Nantucket's westward haven, to Cape Cod guns cradled on the tide, blast the eel grass about a water clock of bilge and backwash, royal the salt and sand, lashing the earth's scaffold. Rock our warships in the hand of the great god, where time's contrition blues whatever it was. These Quaker sailors lost in the mad scramble of their lives. They died when time was open out, wooden and childish. Only bones abide there in the nowhere, where their boats were tossed sky high, where mariners had fabled news of Is, the whited monster. What it cost them? is their secret. In the sperm whale's slick, I see the Quakers drowned and hear their cry. If God himself had not been on our side, if God himself had not been on our side when the Atlantic rose against us, why? Then it had swallowed us up. Four. This is the end of the whale road, and the whale who spewed Nantucket bones on the thrashed swell and stirred the troubled waters to whirlpools to send the Pequod packing off to hell. This is the end of them. Three quarters full. Snatching at straws to sail seaward and seaward on the turntail whale, spouting out blood and water as it rolls, sick as a dog to these Atlantic shoals. 
and the Rhinus, O oh death. Let the sea gulls wail for water, for the deep where the high tide mutters to its hurt self, mutters and ebbs. Waves swallow in their wash, go out and out. Leave only the death rattle of the crabs, the beach increasing its enormous snout sucking the ocean's side. This is the end of running on the waves. We are poured out like water. Who will dance the mast lashed monster of the Leviathans up from this field of Quakers in their unstoned graves? But when the whale's viscera go and the roll of its corruption overruns this world beyond tree-swept Nantucket and Wood's Hole and Martha's Vineyard, sailor, will your sword whistle and fall and sink into the flat in the great ash pit of Jehoshaphat? The bones cry for the blood the white whale, the fat flukes arch and whack about its ears. The death lance churns into the sanctuary. Tears, the gunwale swingle, heaving like a flail and hacks the coiling life out. It works and drags and rips the sperm whale's midriff into rags. Gobbets of blood or blubber spill to the wind and weather. Sailors and gulls go round the stoven timbers where the morning stars sing out together, and thunder shakes the white surf and dismembers the red flag hammered in the masthead. Hide our steel, Jonas, Messias, in thy soul. Our Lady of Walshingham. There once the penitents took off their shoes and then walked barefoot in the remaining mile. And the small trees, a stream and hedgerows file slowly along the munching English lane like cows to the old shrine until you lose track of your dragging pain. The stream flows down under the druid trees. Shiloh's whirlpools gurgle and make glad the castle of God. Sailor, you were glad and whistled with Sion by that stream. But see, Our Lady, too small, for her canopy, sits near the altar. There's no comeliness at all or charm in that expressionless face with its heavy eyelids. As before, this face, for centuries, a memory known as species, neque de call, expressionless, expresses God. It goes past Castle Sion. She knows what God knows, not Calvary's cross, nor crib at Bethlehem now, and the world shall come to Washington. Seven. The empty winds are creaking, and the oak splatters and splatters on the cenotaph. The boughs are trembling and a gaff bobs on the untimely stroke of the grease wash exploding on a shoal bell in the mouth of the Atlantic. It's well. The Atlantic 
You are fouled with the blue sailors, sea monsters. Upward, angel, downward, fish, unmarried and corroded, a spare flesh mark once of supercilious winged clippers. Atlantic, where your bell trap guts its spoil, you could cut the brackish winds with a knife here in Nantucket and cast up time when the Lord, Lord God formed man from the sea's slime and breathed into his face the breath of life and blue lunged gumcombers lumbered to the kill the lord survives the rainbow of his will what a poem that's why i gave you the lead up of how i stumbled upon this in one of my favorite poets and now i promise Nothing will be as long as that. <laughs> Here's a uh, amuse bouche to cleanse your palate. Emily Dickinson gives us exultations is the going. Exul exultation is the going of an inland soul to see. Past the houses, past the headlines, into deep eternity. Bred as we among the mountains, can the sailor understand the divine intoxication of the first league out from land? Sarah Teasdale gives us Sea longing. A thousand miles beyond this sun steeped wall. Somewhere the waves creep and cool along the sand. The ebbing tide forsakes the listless land with the old murmur, long and musical. The windy Waves mount up and curve and fall and drown the rocks. The foam blows up like snow. Though I am inland far, for I live and know. For I was born the, uh, the sea's eternal thrall. I would that I were there now, and over me the cold insistence of the tide would roll, quenching this burning thing men call the soul. Then, with the ebbing, I should drift and be less than the smallest shell along the shoal, less than the seagull calling out to see. William Carlos Williams gives us seafaring. The sea will wash in, but the rocks, jagged ribs riding the cloth of foam, or a knob of pinnacles with gannets, are the stubble. He invites the storm, he lives by it, instinct with fears that are not fears, but prickles of ecstasy, a secret liquor, a fire that inflames his blood to coldness so that the rocks seem rather to leap at the sea than the sea to envelop them. They strain forward to grasp ships or even the sky itself that bends down to be torn upon them, to which he says, it is I, I who am the locks. Without me, nothing else. 
sea fever from John Macefield. I must go down to the sea again, to the lonely sea in the sky. And all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. And the wheels kick and the wind song and the white sails shaking and a gray mist on the sea's face and a gray dawn. I must go down to the sea again, for the call of the running tide is a wild call and a clear call that may not be denied. And all I ask is a windy day with the white clouds flying and the flung spray and the blown spume and the sea calls crying. I must go down to the seas again, to the vagrant gypsy life, to the gull's way and the whale's way, where the wind's like a whetted knife. And all I ask is a merry yarn from a laughing fellow rover, a quiet sleep and a sweet dream. When the long trip over. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow gives us the sound of the sea. The sea awoke at midnight from its sleep, and round the pebbly beaches far and wide, I heard the first wave of the rising tide rush onward with uninterrupted sweep. A voice out of the silence of the deep, a sound mysteriously multiplied as of a cataract from the mountain's side, or roar of winds upon a wooded steep. So comes to us at times from the unknown and inaccessible solitudes of being, the rushing of the sea tides of the soul, and inspirations that we deem our own are some divine foreshadowing and foreseeing of things beyond our reason. Or control. And of course, Shakespeare's got to weigh into all this. Just a snippet from The Tempest. Full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Sea nymphs hourly ring his knell, ding dong. Hark! Now I hear them, ding dong, bell. Now, there's a historian lurking inside this body of mine. You know, in Cumberland, some of the wonderful uh, oaks, live oaks, were used in shipbuilding and have appeared in some very famous ships. And I'm going to read you just a little bit from Oliver Wendell Holmes, Old Ironsides. My Tear her tattered ensign down. Long has it waved on high, and many an eye has danced to see that banner in the sky. Beneath it rung the battle shout and burst the cannon's roar. The meteor of the ocean air shall sweep the clouds no more. 
project, once red with hero's blood, where knelt the vanquished foe, when winds were hurrying over the flood, and waves were white below. No more shall field of victors tread, or know the conquered knee. The harpies of the shore shall pluck the eagle of the sea. Oh, better that her shattered hulk should sink beneath the wave. Her thunders shook the mighty deep, and there should be her grave. Nail to the mask her holy flag, set every threadbare sail, and give her to the god of storms, the lightning and the gale. Oh, this was something I discovered. I had no idea it existed, but now I'm very glad I found it, um, and I want to share it with you. <clears throat> it's by Thomas Hardy. It's called The Convergence of the Twain, Lines on the Loss of the Titanic. One. In a solitude of the sea, deep from human vanity and the pride of life that planned her, stilly couches she, two steel chambers, late the pyres of her salamandrine fires, cold currents thrid and turn to rhythmic Title lies. Three. Over the mirrors meant to bless the opulent, the sea worm crawls, grotesque, sly, dark, indifferent. Four. Jewels in joy designed to ravish the sensuous mind lie lightless. All their sparkles bleared and black and blind. Five. Dim moon eyed fishes near gaze at the gilded. And query, what does this vaingloriousness down here? Six. Well, while was fashioning this creature of cleaving wing, the uh, imminent will that stirs and urges everything. Seven. Prepared a sinister mate. So gaily great, a shape of ice with a kind far and dissociate. Eight. And as the smart ship grew in stature, grace and hue, in shadowy silence, distance grew. Iceberg to nine. Alien, they seemed to be. No mortal eye could see the intimate welging of their later history. Ten. Or sign that they were bent by Pat's coincidence. On being anon twin halves of one august event. Eleven. Till the spinner of the years said, Now! And each one hears the consummation comes and jars to hence. 
almost see it. Now, another one of my favorites. Annabelle Lee from Edgar Allan Poe. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea. There's a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, she was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my view. Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason. As all men know in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so, all the night time, I lie down by the side of my dog. My dog. My life. And my bride in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. And finally, one last thing from Emily Dickinson. This was a poem of hers that I'd never seen before. This book is a treasure trove. I've just given you, I don't know, 12, 13 different poems there are many times more of equal value and note here. And this final poem. I started early. I started early, took my dog, and visited the sea. The mermaids in the basement came out to look at me. And frigates in the upper floor, extended hempen hands, presuming me to be a mouse, a ground for the sands. But no man moved me till the tide went past my simple shoe, and past my apron and my belt, and past my modest too, and made as he would eat me up as holy as a Jew upon a dandelion's sea. And then I started too. And he, oh, he followed close behind. I felt his silver heel upon my ankle. Then my shoes 
and don't just flow with the flow. Until we met the solid town. No man he seemed to know. And bowing with a mighty look at me, the sea withdrew. Thank you for sharing Wednesday, poetry, and the sea with me. Come visit with us on Friday. We've got a treasure store for you there.